Hey, it's me. Sammy Remington is one of the leading advocates and practitioners of New Orleans Revival Jazz today and has been recording and performing professionally for more than 50 years. He's recorded and performed with many of the legends in music and has contributed to hundreds of recordings. A reed player, saxophonist, and clarinetist. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> so how does a man from England become so involved in New Orleans jazz? Well, the funny thing is, when I was, um, I was about, I, I started off on guitar, you know, when I was about 12. And I had a skiffle group and we, you know, played a bit of rock and roll and things. And then I just accidentally came across it by recordings, you know. For, uh, well, it was mainly George Lewis, really, that started me off. George Lewis band. And at that time, it was uh, quite underground music, you know. Um, most of the bands like Chris Barber, you know, like in England, English band. But I was more interested in the, the you know, the American, the real thing, you know. And I just got turned on to it by listening, um, you know, by, by some friends. And I started to just pick up the clarinet myself. I had guitar lessons before, of course. So I had a lot of musical knowledge. And then I uh, picked up the clarinet and taught myself. And then um, I was playing with Ken Collier after about a couple of years professionally. I went professionally when I was 18. And the first week I joined, we did a tour with George Lewis from New Orleans as a guest, which was great because he was my idol at that particular time. We went to Switzerland, a three-week concert tour, and uh, it was very good. So I really got to know George, and, you know, I went, I've, you know, I went to New Orleans in 1962 for the first time, you know, so I was like only 20 then, and met all the musicians and got involved from there on, really. Um, it just, you know, went up and up, and I've been involved... I still am involved with musicians from New Orleans, but then a lot of the masters, of course, you know, the legends have passed by now. So I've got a good memory of all that, and uh, I enjoyed it and recorded with them and everything. So, yeah, it just went like that, you know, really natural. And what is it about the New Orleans sound that you like so much? I think the thing that attracted me was the, first of all, the naturalness of it and the spontaneity and the the emotion behind it you know it's for, to me it's very emotional they play with a lot of emotion and the blues feeling is there of course very strong especially the the new orleans revival was uh, a mixture a kind of influence of gospel you know the church music and uh, blues of course and even rhythm and blues and they were playing like at that particular time you know, you take like the Kid Thomas band, they were playing like pop numbers of that particular time, you know, in the 50s and the 60s and things like this, in their own way, totally different to the pop version, you know, about the tunes. But the, I suppose the, emotion, the, the, the most thing that attracted me was the sound and the, and the emotion behind it, you know, the feeling, which to me is uh, different from, you know, other places like New Orleans's of course, it's very black, and it has that in the music, you know. So basically, it's that, really. Of the recordings that you have heard of New Orleans jazz, mm -hmm. what recording would you say has impressed you the most, or would you say is the absolute best? I can't really say that, because, <laughs> you know, I've got so many, and, uh, you know, at the time... There were certain ones, it depends on your time when you're listening in your life. You know, earlier on I had really favourites, and now you change a bit. And uh, so it's very difficult. But I think, um, you know, the one that impressed me was the first one I heard was the George Lewis band with Elmer Talbot. It's called Jam Session, I think, on an LP. And it had Willie the Weeper and things like this on it, and, um, and Blues, 219 Blues. That was the first one, and I, I heard all the Bunk Johnson and all the American music recordings, you know, that Bill Russell recorded earlier on, so they were very impressive. And then I got involved with, uh, you know, with a saxophone when I heard Captain John Handy when I went to New Orleans, and I got to know him very well. I actually lived, you know, in New Orleans in the mid-60s. When I moved, I moved to the States for nearly two years, 
you know, and that's where I recorded with what they called a December band, which was Jim Robinson, um, Sammy Penn, and Kid Thomas Valentine, and and um, and John Handy, of course, Captain John Handy. So he had a big influence on on the saxophone for me, you know. Then, so yeah, that that was mainly the big influences, really. I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about this time that you spent with the clarinetist George Lewis and what yeah. you found him to be like. Um, George was a very sensitive person to be with. He, I was a very good friend. Um, I took some lessons from him um, in New Orleans in 1962 when I first went around his house in Algiers. In fact, there's a little bit of film on, on my website, but it's not very clear. There's not... There's no sound. It was just done on a. On a it's this it's, it's video, you know, but it's silent. But we put a bit back in on it. It's on my website under videos. Uh, taking lessons from George, it's called. And he was showing me the fingerings. He played an Albert system, of course, which is, you know, all the early clarinet players played that, Johnny Dyers and Jimmy Noon. And um, at that time, George was playing uh, a clarinet, the Selma that was supposed to be belonged to Jimmy Noon, you, you know, apparently. But, you know, yeah, he, he showed me all this alternate fingering on the Albert system as well, especially on the, on the, on the top notes. Typical example is the way George plays on, on his Burgundy Street Blues where he goes up to the top note there. And it's a very singing quality note. Um, there's more using the trill keys, you know, on the top, uh, instead of the orthodox other creeds, so you get a big open sound, and it's not a thin sound, it's very, you know, open to any kind of vibrato, because the use is quite, you know, a, a singing vibrato, of course. And most of the clarinet players had this strong, you know, kind of, it's almost passionate, like a voice almost. Uh, so, yeah, he impressed me quite a lot, and he showed me a lot, and... Uh, you know, I, I saw him a year before he died. I was playing in Minneapolis at the time with the Hall Brothers Band when I was there. In, that was in 60, yeah, 60, 67, beginning of 67. Then I came back to Europe after that. Yeah. So that, you know, this way, it was, he was a very fine, very lovely person. You know, he was great to my family and everything and a very sensitive person. And this time that you spent living in New Orleans, what are your memories from that? What do I remember of it? Yeah, your memories. Uh, well, yeah, well, I was only in New Orleans, you know, for a few months before I, I was living in Connecticut, you know, first of all, where I, where I was playing there, and New York, where I played with like people like Zuni Singleton. I played a session with Red Allen there. And... Um, I moved down to New Orleans, and uh, for, it was only it was only New Orleans for a few months. And I had an offer to go up and play in Minneapolis with the Hall Brothers Band. Butch Thompson is the piano player and the clarinet player at that time. He was uh, drafted in the army then, and they wanted a replacement. So some people came down from Minneapolis and uh, offered me the job up there. So I went up there and played with them. You know, they were playing about three times a week, I suppose, like that. And then the George Lewis came up with the Kid Thomas Band just before I was leaving to Europe with Manuel Paul on tenor sax. Uh, so that was when I saw George, and uh, I saw him one more time just before he passed away the next year in New Orleans when I went back. Yeah, so... Could you ever imagine yourself living in New Orleans again? Well, you know, I go back every year, and I, I don't know, I don't think I could live there the whole year, but mainly the, but the climate is very strong, you know, it's very hot too hot in the summer for me you know I, I was kind of half thinking about it you know I could have emigrated I accepted my emigration and everything when I was living there you know in 60 66 that was in New Haven but then I decided and I don't know it was a very hard decision you know I almost did you know if I went back now well maybe I would have done it I don't know you make these decisions in life and it changes your whole course of course you know so uh, I did think about it at one point, but then I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hoping you can tell us about this annual festival that you play every year. Or oh, the one in New Orleans, you mean? Yeah, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. For someone who has not been, 
What would you say that experience is like? Well, I tell you what, I, I actually played the very first one with uh, with we had a band from coming from England. Barry Barry Kid Martin was his name, and we had musicians from England. We actually played the very first one, which was um, I'm trying to think what year that was. What was that? It'd be like uh, uh, fifty. I think what it was. I think it was '59 or something like that. It was. I know we was playing. There was there was big bands on it, and we was slotted in between Count Basie, and Dave Brubeck, and Jerry Mulligan. <laughs> so we was right on. You know, between that. That was the first time I played the first festival. Wow. And then it was like in a big auditorium. It wasn't like nowadays. You know, like at the fairgrounds, and all that. So that was an experience. Very good experience, and. Um, and then I've been going back. Well, I, can't, I wouldn't say every year, but most most years I've been going back to play. On the I'm, I'm playing with the Palm Court band this year as a guest with the band, and I did the same thing last year. You know, it's usually out by the fairgrounds, and then we play something, maybe a concert outside or something like that. You know, and that extra one. Yeah, but it's very, it's a very good experience. Lost, you know, many people there, of course, and it's also good to listen to the other kind of music. You know, that's going on. So I enjoy it very much. So on that note, being that you played so many of them, what acts have you seen that in particular blew you away? Well, it's not necessary uh, jazz, you know. I, I mean, I could listen to Buddy Guy or something like that. That was very great, you know, when I saw Buddy Guy, the, the only blues guitarist from Chicago. I heard some... Oh, it's a mixture, really. I mean, some I can't remember some of the early early things because that was, you know, all good then, you know, in jazz, as far as jazz was concerned. But the jazz has changed, of course. I mean, the, you know, there's not not many be playing the, the the real, what I call the real style, you know, the like Billy and Dee Dee Pierce and George. It doesn't exist any longer. Although it's still got a buzz there in the audience and there's still a lot of energy, you know. Yeah, I can't really say really. It's, it's just, you know, different years is different. So. <laughs> what about the food down there? Are you a fan? Uh, some of the food, yeah. Some of the food, some of the seafood is very good, yeah. You know, I wouldn't go right over the top, you know. I, I miss food in Europe as well, you know. So... But yeah, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it, going out to restaurants and things like that, yeah. Seafood is good. You were mentioning that there are not many practitioners of the of the traditional style anymore. Well, they're playing traditional, but it's more more Dixieland, what they call Dixieland. You know, it's faster, it's it's a different feel, really, in, in the... I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm just saying it's just different. It's more updated in a way, uh, and they're playing the repertoire slightly changed. They're not playing exactly the same repertoire, although some of the tunes are there. But um, I think the approach is different. Um, a lot, a lot of musicians now playing in New Orleans are not from New Orleans. You know, they've moved down from, you know, from the north. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people outside of that think they are from New Orleans, but they're not. The young people coming down playing. It's like what's been going on, you know, on Frenchman Street in New Orleans. This big movement going on there with young people, and they're playing traditional, but they're not from New Orleans. But they're playing the style. It's, it's amazing. I'm curious what you think about the Eddie Davis New Orleans jazz band that Woody Allen plays in. Yeah, well, when I went to see him, I got invited there because Jerry, you know Jerry, the trombone player? Indeed, yes. Well, he used to play with me all the time. Every time he played, like, 14 years, from every time we passed through to New Orleans and we played in Connecticut. And Jerry was in my band then. And recently we saw him in Copenhagen because we got invited to Woody's concert there. And uh, I, knew, I met Woody before in London. He came over a couple of years ago and, and he was in London. And a friend of mine knew him and... Uh, they, they, had, they had dinner together and, and they were talking about music and she mentioned my name and he said, oh, it'd be great to see Sammy. So I went up to London and met him and we talked for about two hours and had our clarinets in the hotel and we had a really good time. And then we recently saw 
his band with Eddie, because I knew that Eddie from years, you know, and very good banjo player, nice guy as well. And uh, we got invited to go to his concert in Copenhagen. We was in Sweden at the time, so it was just lucky we were there. And we met Woody again, very briefly, in his dressing room, you know, maybe for about 10 minutes. Yeah, we get on very well. Yeah, it was very nice. What do you think so about So Eddie's a big band? friend. Pardon? Yeah, I thought it was very good this time. Yeah, I thought it was excellent, you know. Eddie, p- pianist, and the, I can't remember who they were now, the trumpet player, but I thought it went very well. You were mentioning the phone call that we had before this, that you, that your wife is Swedish. Yeah, she's Swedish, Louise, yeah. We've been married now for, well, quite a long time, you know, 30 years or so. <laughs> and how did you all meet? Well, I was I had a, ma- a manager there in Sweden at one point, uh, uh, way back, and he used to bring me there, and and I met her on a, on a gig there. You know, it was, it was Louis, Louise's sister, she she used to come and see me, and, and then she told Louise, and we met, and then that was it, really. Met in Sweden. What do you think about the power of music to bring people together? What do you mean, like the, to bring people the live music, the people to get to bring them together? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's what what atmosphere the atmosphere you create when you're playing. If it's very natural and not if it's very spontaneous and natural, I mean, I never have a normally I don't have a set program. You know, I have I have a rough idea, but it can change every every evening. I like to change it. Uh, I know it seems a bit bold and and you know, taking a chance, but I, I kind of bounce off the audience. You know, if I feel it needs a, a bluesy, slow thing, and then I play that. And then if I feel it needs an upbeat thing, you know, which a bit more excitement, then I play that. So it can change with every, every audience can be different every night. And I think that holds it all together. And so you get a rapport, you know, you get immediate rapport with the audience, which I think is very important. What does it feel like from your perspective, from the perspective of Sammy Remington, when you perform in front of an audience? Well, it's great. You know, you get, if you get, very very rarely we have a a failure. (laughs) It always goes down pretty good. We we always win over at the end. And uh, it gives me a big, you know, it's a big kick, really. You know, I mean, when I'm not performing into thousands and thousands of people, of course, it's not like, you know, a big rock band or something. You don't get that same kick they get but it's a similar one because we're very close uh you know uh, most of the places i play you're very close to the audience so you've got that you know that rapport immediately much more instead of seeing it on a big screen you know i mean i went to japan you know way back with louis nelson band you know uh went like three times uh we we're on big big places there and on big screens yeah, it's. Uh, I, I prefer playing in in smaller places, smaller venues. I like that rapport, you know, and the audience feedback, and brings everybody together then with the band. Is there a song from your repertoire that has a greater meaning to you? No, I'm very attracted towards some of the the gospel hymns, you know, and, and things like that. I've made recordings. Uh, so it depends on what kind of emotion you're trying to put over. You know, if you're playing something like very emotional, and some of the hymns are like that to me. You know, I'm, I'm not overly religious. You know, but I just get something from that. It's a soul. I think it's more of a soul. And then, of course, there's exciting, there's exciting numbers like you know blues and things like that, upbeat. And Panama, for instance, is always a good one for me to play on Panama rag because it's got the different strains and it's. It always goes well, and there's weary blues and certain numbers. Yeah, but I, I put in every night, and then I try and change it a bit. When you're doing an instrumental performance of a song that has lyrics, are you at all thinking about the lyrics? I'm singing them sometimes. I sing. I sing quite a lot. Yeah, the lyrics are very important because if you learn the lyrics, you learn the timing of the melody. You know, because the lyrics. They got that, that, you know, you can get the timing exactly of the, of the way the tune's written from the lyrics. You know, the timing of it. So it helps you to remember 
the timing of it and say because i don't normally we don't read music on stage i learn a tune from the music maybe and then and then it goes off from there you kind of play it your own way you know with your own timing but yeah with some of the lyrics yeah you know, i sing quite a few songs you know as well what is the best thing about being sammy remington the best thing <laughs> I think the best thing is that I would never change. I would never change what I was, what I'm doing. You know, I'd never change. I'd always want to play music and to do it. All, you know, all my life, I, I never regretted it. And it's not, it's not work to me. If it became work, and then I would lose it all interest completely. I still get, yeah, yeah, still get hundred percent. I still put hundred percent when I'm performing, and enjoy it. You know, that that is the best thing for me. <laughs> so one of the wonderful things about music that you're very aware, aware about is music can resonate with people in all corners of the globe. Yeah. So for anyone who's listening to this, no matter what continent they're on, what, no. would, what would you say to the listening audience? Well, I don't know how many there are, but <laughs> <laughs> probably not many, I don't know, but I'll just say thank you very much, you know, for, you know, liking my music, and I really, I'm in contact with some of you, of course, on emails, and, um, you know, it spreads all over, you know, I wrote, I wrote, we wrote this book, me and Louise, called uh, Sam Remington Life in Pictures, which we published ourselves, and it's been, it's sold to about 18 countries altogether, different countries, you know, spread all over. Australia as well and um, you know they, they it's uh, just great you know that there are some people interested in that kind of music it may not be like the pop scene or anything like that because it doesn't get the, the you know the publicity on the media the same way you know but um, I would just say thank you very much for being interested in what I'm doing in this book of yours Sammy Remington a life in pictures yeah. Is there a favorite picture? Oh, there's so many pictures in there. <laughs> yeah. No, but I've got some. I got I got the, the pictures in the front with George Lewis in Switzerland. There's a couple of them there where we're playing together. That is very good, very nice. As that is historical, of course, you know. Uh, so I like those. Those just a couple in there. How would you define Sammy Remington? Define him? What, define myself? Yeah. <laughs> I, so, I define me as a dedicated musician that's dedicated to New Orleans revival jazz that always stuck to what he believed in from when he was like going from the age of 16 to 75, which I am now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sound very youthful. Very energetic. Youthful. Yeah. Do I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I felt youthful. <laughs> I look youthful. In fact, when you were mentioning uh, when you were mentioning that you were singing, I thought it might be nice if you would maybe sing us a line. Oh, I can't really. <laughs> I don't have any music here. You can hear it on record. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a bit embarrassed about that. <laughs> I sing better when I've got when I've got the music behind me. You know, I don't, I don't sing on me. I'm not. I don't profess to be a good singer, <laughs> but I got my own style, and I'm, I'm okay when I'm on stage because it's part of me. You know. Well, for all the listeners out there, they can visit yeah. sammyremington dot com. Remington yeah. is spelled R I M I N G T O N. Sammyremington dot com. And thanks so much for spending time with us. Yeah, that's great. And thank you. It's very nice to do. You know, it's nice meeting you and uh, doing the interview. Great. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Until next time.